Well, it's Native American Heritage Month, and joining us to talk about those that are working behind the scenes of promoting the athletes or in front of the camera. It is uh, one of my good friends, a mentor in this business, and and uh, I've got to know him the last few years, and, and he's helped me out a lot and certainly helped out a lot of people. It's Steve Weiss of the NFL Network who joins us. Steve, appreciate the time. How you doing today, man? Tyler, always good, man. So good seeing you. So good hearing you with those golden pipes of yours, man. I mean, you, you, you have a voice for the ages. I, I appreciate that, Steve. Uh, plenty to discuss. And, and where I want to start, kind of just on your background, Steve, uh, you, you went to an HBCU at Howard and, and uh, you, you have Native American descent as well. Uh, tell me about just where you came from, what your story is, Steve. Yeah, you know, look, my, my mother grew up in, uh, in Southwest Virginia, outside of Roanoke, Virginia. And it's interesting, you know, her bloodlines and family is very clear looking at her um, that there is, you know, some, some Native American genes in her. I was raised in certain ways. You know, she always was taught to be, you know, Cherokee. Um, but, you know, I've done a lot of research and, you know, I, there was no Cherokee settlement in, in the part of Virginia. There was just a lot of transiency with a lot of the Native American tribes. And so, you know, I'm not going to put myself in, in Elizabeth Warren's category <laughs> and necessarily claim uh, some type of nation. Uh, there is some type of genealogy. Um, at the same time, you know, my father is black. Um, I've been raised more along those lines outside, you know, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and outside of St. Louis, where I grew up. So that's kind of what I've been, you know, affiliated with. You mentioned I finished at Howard University and HBCU, uh, started at University of Missouri, uh, where I played football. Um, but Tyler, you know uh, how I feel uh, about Native Americans, about promoting Indian history, Indian present, and Indian future, and working with groups like NAJA, the Native American Journalists Association, young people like yourself, Indian country today, to make sure the representation is there, that the voices are heard. And, you know, it's part of my advocacy and what I'm doing is to try to get more Native Americans involved in sports journalism, to get them to the NFL network, to let them be visible. Um, and it's just, it's so important to me because there's just so much history that's left untold, that's been skewed. Um, and it's a constant learning process for myself um, to, try to, to put, try to put it out there, to make more people aware that you know, the original Americans, you know, are still here and they're still an important part of our fabric. And, you know, it's 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 something I will treasure and, and, and continue to preach and, and talk about until my dying days. You, you mentioned that you're working to promote uh, you know, native journalists, and I'm sure you've come across, you know, a, a few different native athletes over the years as well. Mm -hmm. What's it been like to just see them and where they come from to, to be a part of the the sports world. I know Keenan Allen is native, uh, right. uh, James Winchester, the chiefs, a few others. Uh, I mean, must be cool to see them get the chance and inspire uh, the youth out there to, uh, on their, on their platforms of sorts. You know, it really is meaningful. You know, Sam Bradford, uh, yes. the former quarterback from Oklahoma, former NFL quarterback. Um, it's, you know, there, there aren't many, but you know, I've done some work through the NFL Network and a couple of colleagues of mine, former colleague Amber Theo Harris, and a couple others down at the Saboba Indian Tribe um, down here in Southern California, kind of in between LA and, and San Diego. And just any type of, I say, legacy or or hero they can latch on to is so important because again, they feel underrepresented. They feel that you know, not all of them, but you know, some folks I've spoken to don't feel that they've gotten necessarily the opportunities to put themselves on that certain stage. Um, I remember at a football camp we had down in the Saboba tribe, there's a young man, um, gosh, well, I can't remember Edward's name, but you know, I got him on the grid and I got him, helped get him involved with the uh, a Polynesian football uh, camp academy, which ended up helping him land uh, a football scholarship. And so these are the things that we have to do to kind of spread the word that not only are folks out there, but we've got to put a lot of the folks say that live on the reservations or um, who are coming through the mainstream scholastic system to put them in touch with people. Tyler, the first time I met you, if you want, if you want to explain it, um, you can, but this is a way I was trying to introduce a lot of people who are of Indian descent 
in front of people at the NFL Network so we can put you in a pipeline to get you in our building and eventually get people like you employed by us. If you want to go ahead and tell that story, I, I, I think people, again, would enjoy hearing your golden pipes. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this was what, I think 2017. It was. Uh, so about three, four years ago, I was in L.A. with the uh, Native American Journalists Association for their uh, student fellowship and award ceremony. And uh, we were told we were taking tours to a couple different studios here and there. I think we went to ABC seven, a few others, and we ended up at the NFL network. And I said, Oh really? Who's going to do uh, this tour with, with us? They said, Steve Weiss, the NFL network. I said, really Steve Weiss. Okay. I, I've seen him over the years and such. That'd, that'd be great to meet Steve. And you gave us the, the whole whip around and showed us that whole facility introduced us to, you know, Marshall Falk and Rich Eisen and Kurt Warner and Michael Irving and all those guys. And, you know, plugged us right in and showed us that incredible experience and made connections. And that's how you and I met. Now you've been a regular on my radio show uh, for the last several years and, and uh, certainly grateful for that opportunity and glad that we got to connect and uh, got to connect with several other students too. Uh, I'm sure you're still in touch with uh, some of the others besides just me that made that trip too. I am, and I'll never forget, there was a young woman named Karina Dominguez, yeah. um, who now works at Indian Country Today with Mark Trahan. Um, and she, you know, uh, Marianne Turk, who at the time was the head of the network, actually came to visit with us. And I'll never forget the impassioned pleas that Karina made about the Washington football team and, and how offensive the nickname was to her and to so many other people. And it, it just sticks out in my mind because it just, it just hurt Karina, and it was such a cause du jour for her and now we circle back when they make the name change i did a show with karina and amanda blackfoot uh probably about a month before the name change actually happened you know speaking on at the time none of us still felt that the football team was going to change the name because their owner 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 daniel Snyder had been so steadfast in saying no and then when it happened it's kind of like wow okay after all of these years and this was not a new cause no. This is something that's gone on for decades. And, and after all of these years after the football club, um, not changing its, its name for that to happen was, was really a monumental step. It was huge. And, you know, we had been call, calling them the Washington football team for some time. And the fact that that's what they ended up changing the name was pretty ironic. Um, but wild how that all worked out. And, I got to tell you, Steve, I, I never thought I'd see the day. You know, honestly, no. I thought that Dan Snyder was going to have to be gone or something. I, I, I'm shocked that it happened and it happened here in 2020, but a lot of people worked hard for that to happen. Well, a lot of people worked hard, but also the unfortunate part of a lot of change in this country happens to be because happens because of negative outcomes, right? Um, and this, you know, it came on the heels of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and, and, and Breonna Taylor to really spark interest. And, and look, it always hits in the pocketbook. Remember, the sponsors, FedEx and uh, Nike and a couple of people who are part owners with the team or had close ties to the financial pipeline of the team said, we're out. And, and it took that type of influence to finally generate some empathy for a cause that's happened for years, and what people, you know, also don't understand about that football club is not only was there pressure for years from the Indian community, but also from the black community. I remember my grandfather, who grew up in Southwest Virginia, would never mention the team name, would barely mention the team at all, because they were the last NFL team to integrate. And the only reason that they integrated under George Preston Marshall, their old racist owner, was because then President John F. Kennedy said, you can't play in a federally funded stadium, RFK Stadium, unless you integrate your team. And that was the only type of force that it took for them to integrate. Just like here, it took a lot of societal upheaval for, and, and economic pressure for the owner to finally say, okay, we're going to change the name. So, Steve, there, there's not very many people that, that look like you or I on, on television as opposed to, you know, what most folks are out there. Do you feel some sort of pressure as a, you know, face for men of color uh, in uh, sports broadcasting? No, I, I feel an obligation. It is not pressure. It is an obligation. Um, and, look, my career would not 
have have had the opportunity to launch if it weren't for two people. And that's Michael Wilbon. Um, he's now you see him on ESPN on PTI, a lot of programming. He worked with me at the Washington Post, as did David Aldridge, who's now with the Athletic, but he's a longtime reporter. You saw him doing the NBA on ESPN and TNT. Mm -hmm. They pulled me up right when I was a college student. You know, they, they I was a part time worker at the Washington Post writing articles doing aggregate for uh, for box scores, taking high school scores, doing things like that. And they saw my grind. Um, they knew my credentials and, and, and they they vouched for me. And when I look, OK, you turn on the NFL Network, you see a lot of people of color on 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 the scene, on the screen. Right. But they're mainly former players. So when it comes to most sports networks and it comes to actual trained journalists of color, there are very few. And then you go to the regular broadcast networks and there are fewer. There are very few people on the three letter networks when it comes to sports of color um, who get the opportunity. So those of us who are here, it is our obligation to open doors and to get the names of people in front of people doing the hiring. Like I've done for you. I've, I've called up people and said, look, there's this guy, Tyler Jones, in Kansas City area, who is just absolutely fantastic, talk to him. And I'm going to continue to do that because that's how it happens. Yes, it's about what you know, but it's about who you know. And as long as I'm in this business, it will never, ever stop being a purpose of mine to reach back and, and get, especially Tyler, to, to get Native American people. It is the, the indigenous, they're, they're, they've just done so much for this country that's gone overlooked. And to kind of get them back into the mainstream um, is just, is just so important to me. Like my middle son went to the university of Hawaii mm -hmm. and to see what the indigenous population is doing over there in the Polynesian islands, they're taking their islands back over the colonization. There's a, there's a huge population population there that is tired of the colonization. You can take your sugarcane fields to the Philippines or elsewhere. This is indigenous land. And, and this is what, you know, we're doing with, with our culture and, and, and just the upswing of pride that you see over there is amazing, you know, and, and I've made tremendous gains with the indigenous population in the, in the Polynesian countries. You know, I've, I, that's why I'm tied with Tua Tungo Bailoa and his family. And you see me doing so much things with the Polynesian football hall of fame and things like that. And it, it's important because these are people who make up the fabric of this country and we've just got to allow them the opportunity to make this a, a better country, whether it's through the media, in front of the camera, behind the camera, it is, again, it, it is so vitally important to me. Not pressure, but an obligation. That's outstanding. And Steve, we're recording this on election day. And I was thinking as I was getting my voting done, you know, I, I would vote no matter what. Don't get me wrong. Right. But I felt like an obligation to my ancestors to vote after all they went through. Natives didn't get the right to vote till 1924. That's less than 100 years ago. I mean, we owed it to them to honor them what they fought for for all those years just to have that right. 100%. And think about this, Tyler. Natives got the right to vote, what was it, 40 years before African Americans got the right to vote. And so you think about some of the things, again, that people of color in this country, from Indians, from what they had to sacrifice right i think about so much of of my upbringing learning about the trail of tears and why you know so many natives won't hold an actual 20 dollar bill because the face of andrew jackson and how he subjected cherokee nation to that to that voyage from georgia and north carolina across the country in the cold to oklahoma for resettlement some of the things that they had to endure just to maintain and, you know, not from not going extinct in this country, because that's what so many of the colonizers wanted to do and to get the right to vote. I have no I am a non judgmental person, but I have no time for people, especially people of color who do not exercise that right. Sure, you may say. No political party has benefited me. Well, in 2020, if you don't see what is going on in this country. And if you do not exercise your voice, because things are, are shrinking, right? For Native Americans, look what has happened from everything 
with the oil pipelines up in the Dakotas to some of the land seizures that continue to go on in big sky country to some of the fracking things that affect um, you know, water and air purity in, in so many areas where Native Americans live. And that continues to work against the causes of the growth for Native Americans. Look at the lack of attention paid to suicides on reservations. It, it is absolutely a damn shame that that is not a, at a forefront, regardless of the political party, part of the conversation. And you've got to use your voice and any type of influence that can be had, which is why it's so great you're doing this. I think what Mark Trahant is doing with American country, or Indian country today out, out in Phoenix to bring these stories to light, to enter the mainstream of information flow, to educate people. And that is why voting, and, and, and again, whomever you vote for, whatever your beliefs are, from the local levels especially, that is why it is so important to educate and understand and, and, to, and to look back on what people sacrificed. I, I just can't with a straight face look at people who don't vote, knowing what people did to get that right. Steve Weish of the NFL Network, John, I guess, Tyler Jones, IndianSports.com here. Steve, we, we talked about young people when it comes to broadcasting. What advice do you have for the younger folks who are just trying to find their identity, their passion in life, whether it's in sports or not? What advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very different from when I came up. Um, just because social media plays such a factor, digital media plays such a factor. But the key things here is, one, learn how to write. That is vital. Whether you're doing radio, television, digital, you have to know how to write. It's the ultimate fallback. Um, but also, don't just focus on one element. Don't just focus on writing. You've got to be able, you know, today to, to edit. I mean, you've got to, you can take an iPhone. You can shoot great footage. You can pop that into a laptop. You can edit content down to a 90 second piece, then you can voice over it. And there you go. You've got a nice package that you can ship to whomever it's, but you have to know your stuff. But also, like I said, Tyler, it's about contacts. If you have the opportunity to go to seminars or to go to conventions, that is where you meet people. You have got to network. When students get back to class or classrooms, instead of just going to class, spend time with your professors or your career counseling people. I'll just never forget at Howard University, you know, when I was the editor of the student paper, some of the professors and career counseling people were just so taken with my work ethic. They would pick me up and take me across the river in Northern Virginia to USA Today. They would say, this is someone you need to know. They didn't have to do that. But again, that's part of the obligation uh, thing where they felt they needed to, to really put me in front of people. But, you know, know your stuff, get out there and meet people like you have. You never stop reaching out to me. And people, you know, reach out to me on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. You, you can do that to anybody. Go to Soledad O'Brien. Go to, again, Mark Trahant in Indian Country today. Put your name out there. We will reach out to help. People aren't going to tell you no. They will like on election night next couple of days because they're going to be busy. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, this is this is what we do. We know we can't do this forever. Absolutely. Uh, Steve Weish uh, joining us here. Tyler Jones here, IndianSports.com. Steve, you've had a great career. So many things you've covered. But one of the most notable was when you broke the Colin Kaepernick story. And we're on that reporting and continued to follow that story. Since then, do you think things have improved for black men in professional sports? Um, in, in, in some ways, yes. Um, I will say them being more outspoken has changed. Um, their voices being heard by some of their team owners has changed. Um, and I don't want to just put this for men because I think in the WNBA, we've seen uh, with the women's national soccer team with bold soldiers like Megan Rapino um, standing up. I think, you know, their, their fight for pay equity. I mean, that's at least even though the courts keep striking this down and, and, and X, Y, and Z, the fact that there's conversation out there to, to help the women get paid just as much as the men. 
um, especially when the women's national team is far more popular, I, I think is significant. But at the same time, uh, you know, without people like Patrick Mahomes uh, speaking up, I, I think there's still a, a look by the fans and sponsors like, okay, we'll, we'll listen to a point. Um, you can do what you want to a point. So it has changed some, but the bigger, the bigger question is Tyler is society. It, and that, and that's where you've got a lot of young people speaking out protests, but back when Colin Kaepernick spoke up in 2016, we saw the video deaths of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling and so many other people, same thing we're seeing today. So that part has not changed. So the outcry and the demand for justice has been greater, but the actual accountability and actual execution of justice has not. That's uh, that's a great point. That's good to know. Um, Steve, you know, looking at indigenous people just as a whole, I mean, you're, you're around them and know about our communities. What, what's one thing that you would want the general public to just know about indigenous folks? There's, we're, we're still here. There's, they're, they're still here. Um, it's, it's so isol It's such an isolationist attitude in this country because it's so diverse, right? We've got Latinx, we've got Asian Americans, we have this. It's so easy to, for, for, for society to say, okay, yeah, there's Native Americans, but they're over here, right? They're on reservations in Arizona in Idaho and in Oklahoma. They are still impacting political decisions. They are still impacting so much of the fabric, but at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, they are being ignored with some very important issues. This, this suicide uh, thing, it just, it just galls me to think that there are so many people with hopelessness that the suicide rate is, is, is out of control, especially on reservations. And it is important that we reconnect with our indigenous people because they can teach us a lot. We can teach them a lot. But we also need to help one another in so many different ways. We keep talking about this, you know, the mental, the mental society and the mental stress on people. Imagine being the original peoples of this country. And a lot of times you're putting it, you're being put into situations living wise that are not healthy. Again, people are invading your land and building oil pipelines and tainting your water. Imagine the mental stress that they are under screaming. And nobody's listening. And, you know, I, I would just beg our government officials, but I would beg people like you, me, and others to get people to listen to them and to do what we can to help and to not just think that they're just a subset of people that's smaller than the Latinx and African-American and Asian communities. They are all part of one fabric that we have got to include in everything that we do. Steve, how do you handle questions about race and ethnicity? Do you get questioned about your background a lot in, in your field and industry? Not so much. I, I would think more societal, um, you know, especially before my hair turned gray, it was constantly, <laughs> what are you? You know, are you, are you Asian? Are you Indian? Are you black? Are you, you know, Arabic? Are you Polynesian? And, you know, I, I kind of, I, you know, especially young, cause my kids get it, man. My kids really, um, get it, especially my son who went to school over at University of Hawaii. Everyone thought he was poly and, and this and that. But I, I take it head on, man. I, I embrace it. You know, I'm, I'm 54 years old. Um, and I just, especially in these times, I just, I take it on, you know, like I said, I've lived my life as a, as a black man. And um, it is important for me just to not shy away from anything in my building, in my workplace to um, stand up for people and not wait for something to happen before saying, hey, this is someone you should look at to promote or X, Y, and Z, even though I am only a front facing person and don't have significant influence, I, I'm not afraid. And I, and I think I've earned some gravitas in the industry because of that. But I think, you know, some of my prouder things are just teaching my sons. I've got three boys, you know, to read, um, about ethnic issues and to read about political injustice and to read about judicial injustice, you know, and seeing them 
um, you know, in elementary school, the book reports on the auto autobiography of Malcolm X, you know, my wife is Jamaican. So, you know, they're also learning a lot of the West Indian culture. So, you know, it's great for them to be able to experience so much and to learn so much. And that's part of me and my wife's um, intent, you know, with our children, like you're going to vote and you're going to learn about issues. We, we sat around a couple of weeks ago, Tyler, with a, a big book on the, on the local candidates and local issues. And we went through this and studied it because it's important for all of us to know what we're talking about. And then they can educate their friends about their cultures, about their beliefs, whatever, um, when they're just kind of sitting around hanging out. So I, I just think that's just, and, and now it's second nature to me. So I, you know, I love it and it's just, it's just important to me. I have more questions and we'll let you go, Steve. Just looking back on, on your career, what you've covered over the years, we mentioned the Colin Kaepernick story was a big deal. What are some of your favorite moments or memories of the things you've seen over the years? Oh, man. There's so many, you know, because I used to cover the NBA. I've covered high school sports. I've, I've, I've covered college sports. You know, the, the biggest, most draining and taxing story I ever had to do was the, uh, the Michael Vick dogfighting investigation. You know, the former Falcons quarterback who got himself embroiled. You know, he fought dogs up in Virginia. And, you know, being in Atlanta, you know, they had their first black quarterback. So you had half the population who loved him, half the population who hated him simply because of his ethnicity. And then having to write that story where you've got a criminal element that actually involved animals. Um, you know, you realize people like, whoa, you know, some people make the argument, well, he didn't kill humans. And then you could see the other argument saying, yeah, how many of us really know people who've been murdered versus how many of us have actually petted a dog? And that's why you're like, wow, it strikes a huge chord. Um, covering the NBA, you know, I covered Michael Jordan in his final dance, not the last dance, the final <laughs> dance when he played for the Washington Wizards. Um, and, and that was that was really, really cool. I think my best memories, you know, of, of covering stories happened in the NBA from the late 90s when the Miami Heat and the New York Knicks had these great battles, you know, some on-court fights um, to getting to cover a guy, Gilbert Arenas, um, who had to be one of the craziest characters or I ever <laughs> dealt with. Um, and that was truly, that was truly, amazing. and Jimmy Johnson, uh, when he, when I covered the dolphins, you know, Don Shula's last couple of years, Jimmy's first couple of years, you know, Jimmy, when I was at the university of Missouri was the head coach at Okie state. Um, when, you know, Barry Sanders is a backup to Thurman Thomas and I was at the university of Missouri and we played against them. Fortunately, I wasn't on the field because I would have been embarrassed, but, um, just some of the characters and, and, and the people um, are the best part of what we do in this business. Now, you as a former college football player yourself, do you have a different perspective yes. compared to most hosts and and uh, and broadcasters out there? Tell me about that. I mean, you're not the the analysts like you know, we see doing color commentary, but you are hosting and reporting shows. Tell me about that from your perspective as a former player. Tyler, that, that has helped me out so much because you know I wasn't a good player, right? I was, I was red shirted. You know, I came in out of high school, like 205 pounds. I was an outside linebacker. I was like big in high school, but too small back then to play in the big eight. So I had to go to the struggle of like living in the weight room and having a late, you know, like I was early 18 when I started. So and I still had three years of growing. So like over the first red shirt year, I put on like 15, 20 pounds, non-chemical. I haven't done that. I haven't done that <laughs> stuff just, you know, lifting, having a growth spurt and seeing what the hard work put into it and then seeing teammates, you know, who would get hurt or would have personal issues or would go through legal issues. So I'm seeing behind the screen and then seeing how coaches, you know, dealt with people or how, how coaches ascended or fell in their uh, careers. Like our quarterback coach, now was at University of Missouri was a guy named Jim Donnan who went on to be the OC uh, at Oklahoma during their great run back in the 80s. And then he became the head coach at Marshall and head coach at Georgia. Well, we've had this great relationship ever since. But, you know, I've had injuries. I went through a coaching change. You know, they, they fired the coaches who brought me in after my red shirt year. So all of these things apply. So a lot of times when I ask questions, I can ask them from a certain vantage point, from being coached, from being hurt, to going through a coaching change that a lot of people don't have. And, you know, I'm, I'm a failed athlete, you know, and a lot of people, what we do are we're wannabe athletes. You know, at least I had a, a swing and a miss. Um, 
you know, and transferring schools and having an opportunity to go to a smaller school and be really good there, but deciding not to play um, because, you know, I realized I wasn't going to go pro and I, and I really wanted to be a sports writer. So there's a, there's so much of that experience. It factors into um, what I've done and, and it has helped me. It has helped me out tremendously and being able to put perspective on so many different things, you know, from how a story is covered to what an athlete might be thinking to asking questions that generate answers that are a little bit different from your normal kind of Q and a type situation. Before we let you go, I'll ask the one football question. Who's the team to beat right now? Right now in the NFL? Yes. Steelers. I mean, look, it's not just because they're unbeaten, but you know, you saw them like against the Ravens did not have a good offensive game. Their defense showed up and, and did enough. I mean, no team is infallible. You know, we've seen that with the Kansas city chiefs, but um, ben Roethlisberger makes a whole lot of difference in the mojo they've got going on at this point. The midway point of the season is something special. Well, now, that all that stuff changes the final month, month Tyler. It, it does. And Kansas City is going to be there. The Ravens are going to be there. The Steelers are going to be there. Who else is going to be there in the AFC? Can the Titans get their groove back? The NFC is a little different. You know, Seattle is really good right now, but their defense is, is really suspect, you know. The Rams look really good, but they're they're kind of inconsistent. The Packers look really good, but their run defense is, is hot and cold. So right now, I'd say your better teams are in the AFC, but there's going to be some teams like the Colts, maybe the Dolphins, maybe the Arizona Cardinals who show up at the end that are going to make us say, wow, this is going to be a really fun playoff run. I'm just hoping that we can we can come to some type of vaccine or manageability of this COVID so we can have some fans in the stands, you know, towards the back end of the season. That'd be fantastic. That's the case. Uh, Steve, real quick, before we let you run here, you mentioned uh, that people can reach out to you and if they get questions or yep. you want to contact you, what's the easiest way to find you, Steve? The easiest way, um, I'm not going to give out my personal information, this way, but it's, <laughs> it's my, my, my Twitter handle and my IG handle are the same. And that's at Weich, W Y C H E. 89, an old Jersey number, um, and DM me. Um, it's open. Just hit me up. People do it all the time. And um, I've made a lot of connections that way. So that that's definitely the easiest way, and and I'm here for you. Awesome stuff. Steve Weiss of the NFL Network joining us. Appreciate it, Steve. Thanks, Thanks man. Th thank you, Tyler.